I went to the store, I got some fermented Oreos, and then I was really upset that I didn't live forever. The world of fermented foods is, is funky, right? Just because something is fermented doesn't mean that it's automatically going to have a positive gut effect. Generally speaking, most of the fermented foods that are out there are certainly not bad, okay? But we have to really go through it with a fine tooth comb to see what's actually giving us a gut microbiome benefit, okay? So there's two different kinds of fermented foods generally. There's wild fermenting foods, okay? These are foods that just kind of naturally ferment on their own, like sauerkraut, uh, kimchi, some kinds of soy, like they'll just, they'll ferment on their own. And then there's ones that are sort of influenced with starter cultures, okay? And things like kefir, kombucha, some yogurts, things like that. So. Two different kinds. That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of a difference in terms of the benefit, but we're gonna break down a few different things. We're gonna break down sauerkraut, we're gonna break down kimchi, kombucha, yogurt, kefir. We're gonna talk about it all. So let's go ahead and dive in a little bit deeper. Are there any benefits to fermented foods whatsoever? Yes. Okay, I'm not saying there's not a benefit. Okay, if you have a fermented food that is going to contribute to what is called a lactic acid producing bacteria within your gut, yes, there's powerful effects. These lactic acid producing bacteria can convert phenolic compounds into proanthocyanins, which can influence what's called NRF2. This can influence the antioxidant enzymes in your body. So what this basically means is it doesn't take a whole lot of a really good fermented food that has a positive impact on your gut to have a positive impact on your body. The hard part is finding fermented foods that actually have this positive impact. Now, when you look at the data, most of the data is showing that dairy-based fermented foods have the strongest impact. So let's start with those first because it's the easiest place to start where there's the largest bodies of evidence. So let's look at yogurt. Now, yogurt, big industry, right? There's a lot of money in yogurt, so it makes sense that there's a lot of studies talking about yogurt, but still, the data's there. In fact, when you look at a 2019 study that was published in the journal Nutrients, only dairy-based fermented foods are the ones that can be considered probiotics because they're the only ones that have really influenced a microbiome change whatsoever. So yogurt seems to be best for microbial diversity. So if you're looking at how do I influence my gut microbiome and get more potential diversity, yogurt is probably a good place to start. But of course, it comes with sugars, it comes with lactose and its other vices, but let's look at research. So the International Journal of Food Microbiology, interesting study, okay, took a look at a lactobacillus fortified yogurt, okay, for 20 days, just giving a serving a day, and found that it did trigger a positive increase in lactobacillus content and also Prevotella content within the gut. So yeah, there was actually a change in the microbiome. Well, let's look at another one. This one was published in Pharma Nutrition. This took a look at four weeks of yogurt consumption. They found that once again, there's a positive influence in lactobacillus and bifidobacterium without a negative shift in the gut ecosystem at all. So it didn't really disrupt the ecosystem. It just added more of the beneficial bacteria. Now, this doesn't mean that yogurt is magical. It means that, okay, when it comes down to actually changing the gut or influencing more good lactate producing bacteria, lactic acid producing bacteria, yeah, yogurt seems to be powerful. Now let's take a look at kefir. Kefir is very similar to yogurt, but it's a different culture. They're using like a lactose fermenting yeast and also a non-lactose fermenting yeast. So it can break down the lactose a little bit more. I'll talk about that in a second. It's usually a little bit thinner, a little bit creamier, and it definitely seems to be better when it comes down to like, I don't know, ease of consumption. The cool thing about kefir, has a lactic acid producing bacteria and acetic acid producing bacteria. Two different angles which are very beneficial for the gut, right? Well, let's take a look at how it looks with the research. So the study that was published in the Journal in Medicine and Food, it took a look at subjects that were going through what's called H. pylori eradication. So they were taking antibiotics to try to get rid of H. pylori. Okay, so they gave subjects either 500 milliliters of kefir or 250 milliliters of milk. At the end of the study, the kefir group had a 78% increase in the eradication amount, and the milk group had a 50% increase in the eradication amount. So the kefir group was much more powerful than the milk. Okay, so yeah, we know that there's some gut benefit there. So the reason that kefir is a little bit better for people with a sensitive gut is because it contains what is called galactosidase producing bacteria. These are bacteria that produce galactosidase. Galactosidase hydrolyzes lactose, which means it helps break down lactose, resulting in a 30% lower lactose content than yogurt. Okay, so this is powerful for people that are just trying to improve their gut microbiome, but are sensitive to dairy. The big one, kombucha. Okay, you really wanna go out and get that kombucha because everyone's drinking them in LA and it seems super healthy and trendy. Okay, but the evidence is bleak. 
Okay, and kombucha utilizes what's called a SCOBY. So it's a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, SCOBY. Okay, now, it makes sense that a SCOBY would be beneficial, but we're only seeing research in vitro. And it does seem to change the microbiome a little bit when you look in vitro stuff, but there's nothing in terms of randomized, blind, crossover studies. We can't see anything in humans, so it's pretty difficult. Now it does contain lactic acid producing bacteria and acetic acid producing bacteria. So we could elucidate that it could potentially have some powerful effects metabolically and all this. The hard part is, is by looking only at in vitro studies, we just don't know if it's doing this in the human body. And we don't know if the fact that it can't be supported by the natural milk sugars, if it's really gonna survive very well. The other thing we have to factor in with kombucha is there's added sugar into it just to create the effect and to feed the bacteria. So that comes with its own negative pitfalls. So when it comes to like probiotic kind of things, I usually recommend either doing like yogurt, dairy, kefir kind of thing for that or utilizing a probiotic versus say kombucha. My recommended probiotic, I put a link down below. It's today's video sponsor because they love it when I do microbiome related content. It just makes sense. It's Seed. So there's a link down below. So Seed is a very interesting probiotic that has a in capsule inside of a capsule. So it's really intriguing. If you look at the footage, you can see there's actually a capsule inside of a capsule, which ensures a little bit better delivery. So very, very cool stuff. And there's a special link that will save you 15% off if you want to try Seed. Again, that's the one that I've been using for over a year now. Really cool stuff. So that link is down below in the description. And a thank you to Seed for the support on this channel. Sauerkraut. Okay. Here's the thing, I love sauerkraut and I tout it all the time. The probiotic effect of sauerkraut is confusing. Now sauerkraut is one of the only fermented foods that has a random double blind study done that shows that it did seem to have a positive impact on people with IBS, okay? So what's going on here? Well, the interesting thing is it improved the IBS like issues with people that were taking it, okay? They were consuming 75 grams of unpasteurized sauerkraut for about six weeks. Positive impact. However, when they actually looked at their microbiota scores, like their microbiome scores, their microbiome didn't really change much. So one could even hypothesize that the reason they had a benefit was sort of the perceived health effect of the sauerkraut, since it didn't actually change their microbiome. But the other thing we look at with sauerkraut is cabbage has a powerful prebiotic effect. So it could be changing the microbiome in some ways or just helping them out just because it's a good prebiotic. Now, the other thing is when you look at studies where people drank the sauerkraut juice, there was an antioxidant effect of what's called camphorol. So rich in camphorol, which could potentially improve antioxidant scores within the body, but also noticed alongside that, there is an increase in glutathione production. So somewhere along the line, something is happening. But I mean, sauerkraut contains a bunch of different things, right? The cabbage is gonna be rich in indole 3 carbonyl diendole methane, things that have powerful influences on estrogen. So it's hard to take a solid look. I don't think it's necessarily the fermented aspect of sauerkraut that makes it such a good food. It's more the fact that you're getting a concentrated amount of cabbage with a prebiotic effect. Now let's jump to kimchi, which compares directly with sauerkraut, right? Because it's still cabbage. But the difference is there's a plethora of ingredients. You've got spices, cayenne pepper, chili powder, you've got radishes in there, you've got all kinds of different stuff that's coming into play. Garlic, onion, things that have a prebiotic effect. Well, when you look at the data with kimchi, it's very positive. You see, there is a potential change in the microbiome, and it's actually on its way to being really recognized for that. So a very, very diverse amount of bacteria that are added into kimchi in the starter culture, okay? But what's interesting is after a few days, it's mainly dominated by one kind of bacteria, okay? So leuconostoc, which, so when you look at all kimchis, they kind of come down to that one sort of rapidly dominant bacteria. But what are we seeing in the data? Well, the Journal of Functional Foods had published a study taking a look at two different kinds of kimchi with different ingredients and stuff like that. They found that both forms of kimchi increase short chain fatty acid producing bacteria. This is positive. This means there was a change in the microbiome. They did see an increase in the levels of certain strains in our gut, unlike in things like kombucha, right? So we see a powerful effect there. The other interesting thing is that there was a reduction of the negative bacteria, the bad bacteria, like E. coli. So we're seeing a positive thing there, like we do see in some probiotics. So we just have to pay attention to that and continue to watch the research. What is intriguing, between the two different kinds of kimchi, there were slightly different levels of bacteria demonstrating that what is in a kimchi could really play a role in its effect, if it's good or bad. The problem is the study didn't really break down what specifically was in them and how it influenced, so we don't really know. Okay, the last couple things I wanna cover are going to be tempeh 
and natto, two different kinds of fermented soy. Now, the interesting thing with tempeh, Indonesian fermented soy, is that no real change in the microbiome, nothing happening there, but there is a benefit in the sense that it breaks down the phytic acid, okay? It allows to be more digestible and allows the protease inhibition to kind of slow down. So you can actually allow the protein to be utilized. So if you're vegan or vegetarian, fermented forms of soy like tempeh might be a better choice so you can get more protein out of it. With natto, the only difference between that and tempeh is that you have the abundance of natto kinase, which could have an antioxidant activity as well. So recapping here, yogurt, good. Kefir seems to be the best. Kimchi, definitely going to be really good and an up and comer and good if you can't do dairy at all. Okay, then additionally, we have kombucha, which seems to be inconclusive or not really much data. Then we have sauerkraut, which is good for IBS specifically. And then we have natto and tempeh, which are really just good because you can get your protein out of them. No real gut benefit there. So as always, keep it locked in here in my channel and I will see you tomorrow.